The upcoming Silent Hill 2 remake must be evaluated in two ways, as a survival horror video game and as a story. The remake of Silent Hill 2 faces a monumental challenge in adapting the story for today, not just because of the subject matter, but because the gaming landscape is completely different than it was in 2001. The story of Silent Hill 2 only worked because it was in a video game 20 years ago. I submit that the same story, told in the same year but in a movie, would have likely failed. The story twists would have been predictable to most audiences at the time, because movie watchers are already accustomed to psychological storylines that deal with memory loss. From Psycho to Jacob's Ladder to Memento, you really gotta find a unique setup to your movie to get a discerning audience to not suspect memory loss or psychotic break or a moment of death hallucination. And Silent Hill 2's premise doesn't cut it. If you put a movie in front of audiences where the guy is saying he got a letter from his wife that died three years ago, I think a good amount of the audience would probably guess the twist pretty quickly. But we didn't guess it when we played a video game with that same premise back in 2001. Part of the reason is because when you're actually controlling the main character of the story instead of just watching them or reading about them, your mind is much less free to wonder about what's really going on under the surface. And you're far less likely to suspect yourself, the character you're playing as, of being the villain. But more importantly, it's because in the world of video games, we were not used to being exposed to deep psychological examinations of characters in the games we played. We, the players, mostly teenagers or children at the time, took this situation at face value. And James is a hard to read character, he comes across as friendly, a bit somber, fairly calm and collected, and curious. Nothing about his demeanor leads you to doubt his motives or his morals. That's part of the brilliance, he comes across as a guy you'd never suspect, because he seems relatively fine. He's contrasted with someone like Eddie, who is repugnant and violent, and someone like Angela, who is obviously emotionally troubled and unstable. They draw your attention away from James, so you don't examine him too closely as you're playing the game. It's genius misdirection. As was brilliantly put in the Polygon article by Mike Drucker in 2021, there's an intentional flatness to James, even in his personality, voiced by Guy Sihi. James reveals very few details about himself and his personal life, most of which come in pieces throughout the game and relate to his marriage. We don't know what James did for a job, what he likes and dislikes, or even how he feels about his life. Outside of his mission to find Mary, James seems to barely exist. This is why there was such a negative reaction from the fanbase seeing the new James as a squinty-eyed, mopey, depressed alcoholic from the opening scene. We are not supposed to know how he feels yet. We are not supposed to have any sense of where he comes from emotionally. The original James was intentionally modeled after the actor Guy Sihi that was cast to play him, and his performance was designed to be dry and unreadable, the polar opposite of what we see in the remake footage. I heard many people excusing the look of exhaustion and sadness on the new James's face by saying it's more believable than the original because now he actually looks like someone who's been through something really traumatic. And that's just missing the point entirely. He's supposed to look normal here because that better sells the audience on his innocence early on. He was intentionally written and directed this way to invoke certain feelings in the player, to not let you know that he just went through something traumatic. He's supposed to be fine. A guy whose wife died three years ago shouldn't look like this right now. The truth of James's situation is also disguised by the fact that the first Silent Hill game starts very similarly, with Harry searching the town for his daughter Cheryl, like James is searching for Mary. There was no twist at the end of Silent Hill 1 that Harry actually did something horrible. We never even learn about Harry in the first game. So as fans of the original, going through the motions of a similar setup, we were extra easy to mislead as we may not even be expecting interesting character development in the first place. In this time period, video games for decades had largely been known for very shallow, inelegant storytelling. And that's in no way an insult, just like how an action movie can have an unoriginal and uninteresting plot and still be wildly entertaining, video games, since they are player-controlled experiences, easily succeed in being excellent despite their stories. 
Hey, the mayor's daughter's been kidnapped. Go rescue her and beat up a bunch of dudes in the street. Hey, this guy has a tournament where messed up people kill each other in car combat to have their one wish granted. It's a bunch of bullshit, but who cares? It's fun. Kill all the aliens to rescue the babes is really all you need to have a good time in Duke Nukem 3D. However, by the late 90s, gaming audiences were craving more. We started seeing a push for more complex storytelling in video games. I'm not saying it never existed before, I'm sure someone is already leaving a comment about some old RPG on the NES with an amazing story, but the late 90s really saw the rise of big epic cinematic storytelling. 1998's Metal Gear Solid comes to mind, as the first time a game truly sucked me into its story. Of course we had Final Fantasy VII, and Half-Life, and Halo, and Silent Hill. The first game's story is absolutely bonkers. The whole religious cult and their birth of god ritual, a girl that has psychic powers and projects her nightmare onto the town, something about a drug smuggling ring, people splitting their souls in half, it's crazy. It's really good, I love it, but it's nuts. Silent Hill 2 being a much more personal story about a man seeing monsters specifically tailored to him instead of being created by Alessa's nightmares in the first game makes it a very different kind of experience. And it is a much more difficult story to retell today. The controversial material is absolutely something to consider, but the real problem is the surprise factor. If Silent Hill 2 as a movie would have been predictable to audiences in 2001, just imagine how it's going to be to a way more informed gaming audience in 2023. There's been a lot of games dealing with psychological trauma in the 20 years since Silent Hill 2 came out. It's going to be a lot harder to keep new players from guessing the twist, and you're also dealing with a story that already has widespread awareness. This is a story that worked in its time, in the conditions in which it was consumed, much like the movie Psycho. Have you watched Psycho recently? It's still an important film, but it doesn't work today like it did when it came out. For those of you who don't know, Psycho is a revolutionary classic Alfred Hitchcock film from 1960 about a killer and a small roadside motel. The film leads us to believe that the motel owner's mother is very abusive towards him, and she herself is responsible for the murders. We hear the owner arguing loudly with his mother from their nearby home, his mother scolding him for his sick and perverse ways, shaming him at every opportunity. And right at the end, it's revealed that <gasps> his mother is actually dead, her corpse rotting in the basement, and the owner has been dressing up as her to go out and kill. This was a shocking revelation to audiences in the 60s, because these kinds of stories simply weren't told. Dissociative identity disorder, though having been a documented phenomenon for centuries, was not a commonly known disorder to the public. Most people had never even heard of the idea that someone could believe they were someone else, as evidenced by the long, painful, boring explanation at the end of the movie where the doctor goes on and on and on explaining how Norman believed he was his mother. Audiences needed to have this explained to them in the 60s because it was such an unheard of concept at the time. Now, if you show Psycho to anyone, not only will the twist at the end seem obvious, but it'll come across as silly, and the long explanation at the end feels entirely unnecessary. Part of it is simply dated filmmaking, but if you simply retold the story of Psycho in a movie today, it's just not going to work the way it did back then when the concept was fresh. That may be part of the reason the 90s remake of Psycho was poorly received. Audiences either already knew the twist, or the twist failed to have the impact it used to because that kind of story development is no longer surprising. This is what I've been fearing in a Silent Hill 2 remake. Actually, it's hard to imagine how this project could have worked. Black and white has more impact, and once you know this famous story, it's hard to be shocked as you just sit there and wait for its most famous scenes. But I'm not saying that the only value in Silent Hill 2's story is the shocking twist. The game starts making James's guilt more and more obvious towards the end, before you even get to the hotel and see the explicit evidence. A major part of the story is also the journey you take through the environments and experiences that make him confront his buried guilt. We will have to judge the remake on how well it executes on this aspect too, regardless of knowing or guessing the ending beforehand. But there's a lot working against the game at this point, 
and no matter how well they execute on these other parts of the experience, it's not going to have the intended effect if players easily figure out what they shouldn't know early on. Some stories are designed to work best in the time they are told, and trying to retell them to people in a very different stage of the world, well, a lot of times you're just asking for trouble. Additionally, there is the issue of controversial and problematic aspects of the story. As we play, we gradually learn that the calm and friendly James we see as the character we control has a dark side. We met at the hospital. It was last year. You liar! Laura, I... The manifestation of Maria represents the fun, sexy, carefree image of a woman that he would like to be with, while his wife spent years suffering and dying and he had to deal with it. Smothering her with a pillow certainly wasn't the right thing to do, and as we hear in the ending confession of the two most common endings, he tells himself he did it because he couldn't stand to see her suffer anymore. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. <laughs> But he quickly admits that's a lie, and he did it because he resented her. He wanted to move on with his life, and he ended up hating her. No. That's not the whole truth. You also said that you didn't want to die. The truth is, part of me hated you for taking away my life. James's journey in Silent Hill 2 is not just about remembering what he did, but owning up to how selfish he had become, and having to decide if he even deserves to go on after this. James talking to Mary at the end of the game is not actually happening. Mary is dead. These conversations of him admitting or denying what he's done, and feeling he's earned Mary's forgiveness or not, are all projections of his own feelings and his guilt. There is no actual forgiveness here, and that's something critics really need to keep in mind when they critique this game's story. The ending where James feels forgiven and escapes to start a new life is in no way condoning what he's done. He forgives himself, and you get to decide if that's good enough. It doesn't change what he did or why he did it. It's just possible to get an ending where he realized that he does feel really bad about it and regrets his actions. How much that's worth is up to you. Depending on your in-game actions, Silent Hill 2 can end in three very different ways. The most compelling in my eyes is that he does not forgive himself. He hates himself for what he's done. His guilt is way too heavy and he drives into Toluca Lake and he dies. So anyone criticizing Silent Hill 2 for having a problematic protagonist, yeah, no shit. He's a guy that feels so awful that he kills himself at the end. However, there is another ending that is incredibly interesting. Again, depending on your actions, James can go into full denial mode. The conversation between him and his imagined Mary plays out very differently. Instead of him saying he couldn't stand to watch her suffer and then correcting himself, Mary corrects him, confessing to being a burden, seeming to understand and excuse why he killed her. James admits to having those feelings and seems to drift off into his own thoughts, not feeling much remorse. I couldn't watch you suffer. Don't make excuses, James. <laughs> I know I was a burden on you. You must have hated me. That's why you got rid of me. It's true. I may have had some of those feelings. It was a long three years. I was... This conversation ends with him seeing his image of Mary turn into a horrible monster, whereas in the other endings, it is Maria, dressed as Mary, that becomes the monster. On one end, we have James battling and defeating a monster born of his selfish desires, and on another, we have him battling and defeating a monster born from the image of his burdensome sick wife. Same boss fight, huge difference in context. And in this ending, James is completely gone at this point in a way hypnotized under the power of his own desires as he talks to Maria on his way out. I want you. I want you with me. 
Are you sure? Come on. Let's get out of here. What about Mary? It's okay. I have you. He leaves basically succumbing to his dark side, having not learned much, and just putting his guilt aside, to focus on a new life with his manifestation of the perfect woman, who herself is showing signs of illness. Will he find himself in the same situation that led him here in the first place? Will the cycle continue? <coughs> You'd better do something about that cough. This is controversial storytelling, especially in a video game. Due to the fact that there are these multiple endings, Silent Hill 2 never comes down plainly on the side of James is a horrible man, a wife killer, and you should hate him and he deserves to die. This story isn't about picking sides, and like I said, if he does find forgiveness, it's not from his wife, it comes from within. And how much value self-forgiveness has in this situation, you have to decide for yourself. The game isn't telling you how to feel about what happened. And I find it hard to believe that James's actions were entirely selfish. I believe that there is good in him. While saying he killed her to stop her suffering is certainly being used as a justification to avoid his true feelings of wanting to get rid of a burden, I'll bet there really is part of him that felt bad about what his wife was going through. He probably did hate seeing her suffer the way she did for three years. People are capable of two feelings at once. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. James, if that were true, then why do you look so sad? It's entirely possible for a generally good person to be worn down by their circumstances after years, and they end up doing something horrible to get out. He's a complex, real person, and reality is usually a bit more complicated than people portray it in their sensationalized stories, where we see a news headline and immediately assume someone is garbage and there's no complexity behind the horrible thing they've done. That's the brilliance of Silent Hill 2. At the end, you don't really know how to feel, even in the best ending, when he leaves to help raise Laura because he thinks that's what Mary would have wanted. It's hard to feel joy for this man. In the Maria ending, you feel pity and possibly disgust as he accepts no responsibility. And in the suicide ending, it's hard to feel satisfaction or celebrate his death for being a bad person because of how obviously bad you see he feels after the journey you've taken with him. And while the In Water ending where James dies is considered the canonical ending by many for various reasons, the writers of Silent Hill 2 have never actually confirmed that. They never intended the story to have a set conclusion. I believe it is the most narratively satisfying ending, but it's far from the most interesting. I don't think any ending should be viewed as an official end to this story, because the different ways it can play out is the most interesting aspect of all of it. We don't need to know the ultimate fate of this character, because the choices he can make and the multiple possible endings inform us of so many aspects of his personality, making him the complex person we've come to know. Without them, Silent Hill 2 is less. I sure hope some hack director doesn't come along thinking he can take this multifaceted narrative experience and compress it into a singular definitive story that removes all the nuance that made the game brilliant. That's not gonna happen, right? With no set way to feel about what James did, no matter what ending you get, some people are led to have horrible, horrible opinions on the game, dismissing all of the complexity of James's character as him being a horny guy that killed his wife because he was obsessed with sex, which is so reductive it's insulting to everyone who poured their hearts into creating this story. I swear, the whole sexual frustration angle has been blown so out of proportion by some of the fanbase. It ends up reducing the complex emotions of the protagonist to guy just wanted to get laid. If anyone knows what it's like to be taking care of a slowly dying family member or friend for years, you know the wide range of extreme and conflicting emotions it causes in you. Even if you deeply love someone, you can end up in dark places resenting them and wishing it would end already. This is an incredibly complex theme, and it's why Silent Hill 2's story is so powerful. It's frankly disgusting to see it completely misrepresented by so many people for so long. 
I present the horrible Kotaku article from 2022 that calls him horny twice in the same list of character traits, and then goes on to claim that it's a fault of character design that they aren't able to admire or empathize with him, in the same paragraph that they complain about Leonardo DiCaprio dating women in their 20s. It's weird, man. It's a really weird article of just scattered directionless nonsense and hate. An article that somehow, despite its intellectual ambitions, manages to end with a sentence displaying stunning ignorance. I know I'm spiteful, but I think James deserves what he gets. Well, there's three endings. In two of them, he survives, one of them in blissful denial and one finding a way to forgive himself and trying to start a new life raising a young orphan child. What are you talking about? Deserves what he gets. You must be referring to the ending where he dies, but that's only one way the story can end. Which brings me to my concerns over the remake's narrative direction. Outrage articles like this one are just waiting to be created to capitalize on the algorithmic traffic around this game's release. I feel like we're going to see all kinds of hot takes about how Silent Hill 2 glorifies a wife killer. The game's story is misogynistic by making us sympathize with him even in the slightest. It's wrong to show this horrible crime in anything other than black and white. He's a monster, he should be in prison or dead. Anything else is a dangerous endorsement of his actions. He should be plainly portrayed as evil and unredeemable at the end, no matter what. That's how some people are going to see the story of Silent Hill 2 these days, unfortunately. Divorced from nuance and context. And my concern is that Bloober Team, a studio that already got backlash for the way they mishandled mental illness and emotional trauma in their game The Medium, is going to be thinking about the media reaction to their retelling of this controversial story. In a world where everyone is hypersensitive and polarized, ready to label anything as problematic or degenerate or harmful to certain groups or causes, can the story of a man murdering his wife and possibly walking off into the sunset even be told? In a modern AAA budget game that's going to get massive global exposure and likely move a few million units? I don't know. I mean, I, I hope it can be. They're making the damn game. But I worry that they may try to modify aspects of the story and James's character to try to avoid the kinds of controversy that might distract from the game they're making. They may even remove the other endings and just go with the one where he dies, coming up with some lame justification like, Well, the in-water ending is considered the canonical ending by many, so we decided the most effective way of telling this incredible story would be to focus in on this one direction of the character and make it the best it can be. I can imagine them saying some bullshit like that, just so they don't piss off groups of people who aren't even going to buy the game in the first place. There's going to be people ready to leap all over aspects of Silent Hill 2 that they see as offensive. Maybe someone is going to have a problem with Angela being a total nutcase just because of the abuse she suffered. Oh, it's tiresome to see victims portrayed this way, as if we're incapable of healing and finding a way forward. Of course, abused women have to turn into murdering lunatics that talk like children even in their 30s. This stereotype does harm to real survivors. Maybe someone is going to take offense to Eddie's everything. They're using Eddie's obesity to inspire disgust in the player and make you think he's a slob, showing his belly sticking out and having him scarfing down pizza. It's offensive to show fat people as objects of repulsion, and this portrayal is not in line with our modern ideals of body positivity. I mean, can't you see this happening? I can. I hope it doesn't. In this case, I really hope to be wrong. And thank God the original Silent Hill 2 came out in a time when these articles didn't exist. If none of this happens and people come back to this video leaving hundreds of comments about how stupid I was to be concerned about it, that's a small price to pay. I would prefer to be wrong on this, we'll just have to wait and see. All I can do now is plead to Bloober Team, please stick to the source material, and just hold strong through whatever crap they may throw at you. Don't try to tone it down or simplify it. The moral ambiguity is what makes the story so damn interesting in the first place. We may indeed get a solid survival horror game in the Silent Hill 2 remake. As I said in the beginning, it must be evaluated as a game and as a story. If they don't nail the story and the characters, they may nail the gameplay. 
We could absolutely still get great level design, impressive graphics and a nice art style, horrific imagery and monster design, beautiful music and creepy atmospheres, satisfying and responsive combat, thoughtful inventory and resource management, engaging puzzles, tight controls, there's still a lot that can go right. And if Silent Hill 2 Remake plays great as a video game, I will be here to sing its praises from that perspective. That's a promise to you, dear viewer. I will not get sucked up in a storm of hate if the response to this game is negative just because of the story. If it actually plays well, I won't call the entire product shit. But hear me now, if the story is messed up, they're gonna have a problem. Silent Hill 2's story is arguably more important than the game it's featured in. If it's messed up, I'm gonna be upset, but I will not let it influence my view of the rest of the experience. Because I love survival horror gameplay. I'll be here to give my full thoughts on the game when it comes out. Please subscribe to the channel and ring the bell if you haven't already. I'll see you when the game comes out. I'm so nervous.